Hello, everybody. Yes, just me today. Um, I just wanted to do a quick intro. Um, this is the 1975 Nathan Knorr talk that he gave right after Freddie Franz in Los Angeles, California. And uh, I have listened to this entire talk. And nowhere in here does he say that it couldn't be 1975 for the time of the end. And so I'm just going to tell you a few highlights. This talk is an hour and 45 minutes. Now, most of the time he is talking about the great expansion work that, you know, bringing in the great crowd and all the numbers and people getting baptized and how Jehovah's opening up the lands that are under ban, you know. And uh, mostly that's what this talk is about. But at one hour and 21 minutes, he does say how much longer we don't know. But things are happening. And then uh, at about an hour and 40 minutes, maybe an hour and 35 minutes, we are accomplishing this great work at the end of this system of things. Now, we all know that means Armageddon. Um, and so, you know, like I said, just a couple of things here, and he's talking about all the great work that's going on and expanding. And then he's like, you know, but we have to plan for the future. So that's why, you know, they're doing all this building and adding on and, you know, just like they do now. Oh, the end is right here, you know. The rank and file don't have time to get an education and have a career, but yet they can go on, you know, building and stuff like that. I know, I'm getting riled. Uh, but anyway, I've listened to this talk, and in Son of Thunder's judicial hearing, the elder said that Brother Nor said it couldn't beat 1975. And I am here to put this entire talk in titled Working Together with Him, given by Nathan Nor in 1975. The same convention that Freddie Franz gave his, and he never says there's no way it can't be 1975. Or, yeah, there's no way it can be 1975. He never says that. So, anyway, um, for those of you brave enough to go through the whole thing, I've put a couple of comments, but other than that, the whole talk is uninterrupted, and I tweak the audio so it doesn't have the clicking sound. So, enjoy, and you all have a great weekend. Working together with him, Brother North. It certainly is a pleasure to be with all of you in Los Angeles. And first of all, I want to bring to you the very warm, loving greetings of the Bethel family in Brooklyn, New York. Brother Franz and I also have the grand privilege of traveling around the world together, starting in Portugal, going through Europe, going over to Asia, down to Asia, and then to the islands south of Singapore and Australia, New Zealand, this is Tahiti, Hawaii, and in all of this territory that we have covered, we have the privilege of speaking to around 120,000 of our brothers and sisters. And wherever we went, the large crowds that gathered together all requested that their loving greeting be brought to you here in Los Angeles. We are living in very interesting times, as Brother Franz is very pointedly brought to our attention. But when we see what is happening right in our own midst, it places upon every one of us a very grave responsibility. In this auditorium this evening, I understand there are the elders of the congregations nearby and ministerial servants in your families. And this is very fine that all of you could be here together tonight and take the message back to your local congregations. But being an elder, places a grave responsibility upon you. And this is something that every male member in Jehovah's organization should be interested in being. And not just coming into the organization and uh, 
working along with it. But uh, you elders who are here this evening and those who are listening in the many other auditoriums that are tied in by direct wire, all of you have a very heavy responsibility resting upon you right now. We always have had. But now we see a great crowd of people coming into Jehovah's organization from every nation, kindred, and tongue. As you well know, having read the yearbook for 1975, you have observed that uh, 297,872 persons were baptized last year. All of these people have dedicated their lives to do Jehovah's will, and they have come into the congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses, 34,000 of them, all over the world. And they need your care. Jehovah God has allotted part of his congregation to these elders scattered all around the world so that they might be given the proper care and attention. And so it's necessary for these elders appointed to serve the congregations to really shepherd of the flock of God. Not only those who have been in the organization for many, many years, but all of these new ones that are coming in in great numbers. Something very unusual has happened in the last few years. The society has kept records of those who are being baptized since 1948. And before I left the uh, Brooklyn on this uh, tour around the world, visiting many branches and talking to missionaries and associating with the congregations. I checked up just to see what had happened uh, in the way of baptism over all of these years. From 1948 to 1968, 21 years, there were 1,292,000 persons that have been baptized that we have a record of uh, through the report sent into the society. That's 21 years, uh, 1,292,000. In the last six years, from 1969 to 1974, there were 1,089,000 persons baptized. Now this is truly remarkable. There's no question in our mind that we do see a great crowd of people coming into Jehovah's organization. And it was Christ Jesus that said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, this will flock, and these I must also gather, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. Well, there's no question about it in our minds today that this great crowd has been gathering together, particularly since 1935, but now in these last six years, there have been well over a million, or well over half of the publishers that are going out preaching the good news of God's kingdom have been gathered together. Now the elders that are appointed by the Holy Spirit, that are appointed to be shepherding the flock of God, in the last six years have one million more people to shepherd. And maybe during the year 1975, you may have another 300,000 or who knows more. The report so far shows that during this new service year, 1975, there has been a marked increase in the number of persons that are taking their stand on Jehovah's side and dedicating their life to God. In the United States, during the first three months of this service year, we find that uh, 1,000 more persons were baptized than the same three months of the previous year. There were more persons baptized in Canada than the previous year, during the first three months. When we look at uh, Italy, we find in the first three months of last year, there were 782 baptized 
but in the first three months of 1975 service year, 1,889. In Japan, there were 709 in three months last year, 1,437 this year. Now, these are just a few examples of what is going on in different parts of the world. As far as the interest shown among those people that we are having Bible studies with, they are making up their minds that this is a particular time for them to do something. And they are doing something. In 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, the verses 1 and 2, we read, Working together with him, we also entreat you not to accept the undeserved kindness of God and miss its purpose. For he says, In an acceptable time I heard you, and in a day of salvation I helped you. Look, now is the especially acceptable time. Look, now is the day of salvation. These words were spoken by the Apostle Paul, written to the Corinthians, and he was telling those Corinthians 1900 years ago, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Well, it was. That's when those people were living. They couldn't have heard the message of Jesus Christ any time before, <laughs> and then some years later they would have died and then they wouldn't have had the opportunity. So while they were alive, and they could hear and see and think and have action, while they were conscious creatures here upon the earth, that was the acceptable time for them to take a stand for Jehovah God and to work uh, together with him. And that's what the Apostle Paul was inviting these Corinthians in the second book letter that he wrote to do. Working together with him, we also entreat you not to accept the undeserved kindness of God and miss its purpose. Now, we're living 1900 years later. Now is our acceptable time. Now is our day for salvation. We're alive. Our parents have brought us into this world. We have grown up, we have intelligence, we've had the opportunity to hear the truth, read the Bible, study God's Word, and we realize that now it is necessary for us to take a very definite stand on Jehovah's side in order to gain life, and that's what salvation means, to keep on living. And the way to do that is to keep on working together with Him with Jehovah God. Now, this gives us a marvelous opportunity, and now 300,000 people nearly last year have come into our congregation. And all of the elders of God's uh, congregation today have a marvelous opportunity of helping these new ones to see their wonderful privilege of service. One thing that we're very much interested in is seeing our brothers and sisters put on a new personality. Make a change from living like they did in the old world. It takes some time. This takes effort. But we do know that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, mildness, and self-control, as stated in Galatians 5.22. But just ahead of this uh, comment on the fruits of the Spirit of God that we are to seek after and uh, get a hold of and make part of our life, he also describes the way that the world lives. Their theft, their drunkenness, their uh, idolatry, their fornication, their extortion, their... Uh, worshiping of God falsely. He describes many, many things that this world is doing. And those who are going that way, he says, will not receive the blessings of the kingdom of God. But when you get a knowledge of the truth, 
and you want to do Jehovah's will and work together with him, then we want to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. The elders in the congregation can do a lot in assisting these new ones coming into the organization to seek after that fruitage of the Spirit. But in doing so, we have to bring our spirit, our power, our force, our life, around to seeing it God's way and bring forth the fruits of God's spirit, not ours. Being born in sin and shaped in iniquity and being in the world and raised uh, and educated in it, we form a spirit of our own. It is the spirit of the world, the spirit of the devil. And uh, this spirit is usually expressed in uh, irritation, anger, uh, not too much love. A lot of people have love for their family, love for their children, love for those they know, but not too much love for other people. They do not hesitate to steal today. People that are working for employers, we find in our reading material in the various magazines of the world, and also the information brought to us through the Watchtower and the Awake magazine, how a tremendous amount of valuable things are stolen from their employers. And people think nothing of it. They get paid, and they still steal. There's no love for the employer there, otherwise it wouldn't be robbing them. And as we look into all walks of life, the morals of mankind are very, very low. Men do not hesitate to go out to somebody else's wife and have sexual relationships with her, or even uh, single people having relations with anyone that they may have the desire, and too often the other person is desirous of the same thing. Morally, the world has sunk into the same debauchery as it did in Paul's day. Now the people that are coming into the organization are coming from the world. They're leaving the devil's organization, Babylon the Great, and they are seeking life and happiness and joy with the organization that Jehovah God has blessed so richly during these years, his organization. And they may bring with them some of these bad habits of theirs because they haven't had anything to make them change their way of life. And each one of us has a spirit. We have a force, an active force, just like Jehovah God has an active force and uses it to accomplish things among mankind and on this earth. He has a power. And every living creature has a force within, him, within himself or a spirit, an active force that accomplishes things and does things, and it expresses itself in many ways. Now, uh, here in this uh, comment that I was reading from Galatians 5.22, we should bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. One of the fruits of the Spirit was long-suffering. I'm not going to deal with all of the fruits of the Spirit this evening. I'm just going to deal with this one, long-suffering, because so many people get this word, long-suffering, mixed up with persecution. And they think that they have to suffer long because of the trials and difficulties and pressures that come upon them from outside, from the world, the devil's organization. But long-suffering and persecution are not the same thing. Long-suffering has a lot to do with you, your own spirit. First of all, long-suffering means that one endures injury or provocation in a patient way. We could say it is law and patient endurance. Provocation is something that incites or instigates anger or irritates. Sometimes uh, it doesn't take much to get us irritated individually. It doesn't take much to make us angry when we see something else going on in the congregation. For example, maybe someone is coming into your congregation recently baptized, made a dedication to God, 
Maybe he doesn't cut his hair just the way you'd like to see it cut, and this irritates you. I don't see why that fella can't change his haircut. And you sit there in the meeting, and you are irritated. You're not very long-suffering. Your spirit is not very long. If you look in the interlinear translation of the New World translation of the Bible, and you find the word long-suffering in the regular reading material, and you look under the Greek, you'll find that it is long as the spirit. Your spirit. How long is your spirit? How long can you sit in a kingdom hall without looking at the other person's haircut and still enjoy the lesson? Well, let's suppose this individual comes into the congregation of God, and he's very enthusiastic, he took a hold of the truth so fast, he really enjoys it, he loves it. And the person that was studying with him told him, Now, when you come to the kingdom hall, and we want you to, don't be backward in expressing yourself, because there should be an interchange of faith, both yours and mine. So when I watched our study, why the brothers and sisters there, they raise their hands. And the conductor will call on you. Well, when he points to you or calls you by name, well, make your expression. So this very enthusiastic young person comes into the organization and he just loves the truth. He wants to learn everything he can. He studied his lesson before he came. And there he is in the third row of the congregation and almost every question that is asked by the chairman up goes his hand. And pretty soon this person on the other side of the aisle is very, very irritated. Now, why doesn't that person know that he doesn't know anything? Why doesn't he keep his mouth shut? There are other people here in the congregation that could talk. Yes, there are. But sometimes their hands aren't up either. And sometimes that person who is very much irritated never thinks of raising uh, his hand or her hand. He'd rather sit there or he'd rather sit there and let her spirit get shorter and shorter until it's ready to pop, really get angry, really get irritated, and by the time the watchtower study is over, he leaves that auditorium or that kingdom hall and didn't get one thing out of the letter just because that one person talked too much. Well, uh, how long is your spirit? There are many things that could occur in a congregation by some individual that you just don't like about them. Maybe the language the person uses in the congregation irritates you. They have come out of the world, maybe they were hippies, and they haven't changed their vocabulary yet. And uh, someone might say uh, in the meeting, well, God did his thing. Oof. It just shocks you, maybe, to hear something like that, and you become irritated. Now, why doesn't that person learn some good Bible language and talk the way the Bible talks. And uh, so uh, this person uses some language that uh, gets over the point that uh, it's the modern day speech and uh, he's been using it all his life and he hasn't been around us very long. So he doesn't use what we call theocratic language. But somebody else in the congregation becomes very irritated and sometimes to a point of anger. Maybe that's you. Maybe one of you come to the congregation and you say to yourself, well, I hope that person that talked all last week won't be here this Sunday. Well, do you really feel that way about it? Are you so short in your own spirit and love and interest in other people in the congregation that you wish they weren't around? What are we all trying to do? We're all trying to work together with Jehovah God get his work done in these last days. And he is calling all kinds of people. People from all nations, kindreds, and tongues. And now with a million people coming into the organization in the last six years, we're bound to hear and observe individuals that have not made as much progress maybe in the truth as you have had or made. But 
one thing we should have done during the years that we have been in the truth is show a little longness of spirit, long-suffering towards other brothers and sisters in the congregation that maybe have not had the time to bring out the fruits of the Spirit in them in harmony with the fruits of the Spirit that God has and uh, had in man in the original creation. This world has gone down pretty far. It's in uh, the depth of debauchery in a sink which is full of dirt and filth. Now these are the people that are leaving the old world and the Apostle Paul had the situation in his day just as it is today. Back there, uh, Paul wrote in the 6th chapter of Corinthians about what do you not know that those who commit fornication, adultery, thievery, drunkenness, and so forth will not inherit God's kingdom? But yet some of you were like that. But you have been washed clean. Now that they have been washed clean, it is expected that they will make progress and put on this new personality. And the Apostle wrote several letters dealing with this new personality. And we should take off the old one, put on the new one, which is in harmony with the accurate word of God, the accurate knowledge of God. The longer that we are in the truth, the more we come to the watchtower study, the service meeting, take part in the theocratic ministry school, go to the congregation book study and attend the public meeting. The more we spend time with God's organization, with his people, the more we keep close to this spiritual paradise that Jehovah God has brought us into, the more we're going to take off that old personality and the more we're going to put on that new one. This is very essential. And we see the change. So when some of these new people come into the organization and maybe they speak differently than you like it, use language that you're not accustomed to, or speak too often, they're just trying to show their zeal and expression and love for Jehovah God, and this is something new to them. We don't want to slow them down and say, keep quiet and quit talking. No, after a while, they might do that of their own accord if enough hands are raised. Well, suppose you are one of those persons who are very short of spirit. You have no long suffering. You do not have this quality towards your brothers and sisters in the congregation. What should you do? Well, certainly you shouldn't leave the congregation every week uh, mad and angry and cross at someone or two or three individuals and getting nothing, nothing out of the... Uh, spiritual things that were discussed, it would be better for you to go to an elder, or maybe two or three elders, and just unload yourself and say, you know, when I come to meeting, and I see that certain person in the meeting, and I know he's going to talk, I just close up. I start gritting my teeth and saying to myself, I hope that person doesn't talk today. And right away his hand goes up to the first question and he speaks up and I am all upset. Now couldn't you elders go and tell that brother to keep quiet? Well that wouldn't be a very nice thing to do for an elder to go and tell a new person coming to the congregation we don't want to hear your faith. If he says something wrong the chairman will correct him or someone else will raise his hand right away and give the right answer and correct it. Furthermore, the paragraphs will be read after the comment, and you'll be able to see the difference between what he said, and, and he will too as time goes on. Well, maybe the elder will speak very kindly, mildly, to the individual that is complaining, and say, uh, well, now you've been to the study for the last several weeks, and I've been the chairman. I know this uh, new individual raises his hand a lot, but... Really, when there's no other hand up, I, I just ask him to talk. How often have you raised your hand in the last three weeks? Well, I haven't raised my hand. No, I haven't raised my hand. And I don't intend to as long as that fellow is talking in the congregation. 
Well, maybe you could help that person in the congregation if you'd raise your hand and I'd call on you and you could speak the way you like to hear people speak in your vocabulary. You could say the things the way you want them said. And I'm sure that this new person in the congregation would be very delighted to hear your faith expressed here in the congregation. Really, that's all he's trying to do is express his faith the way he sees you. And I'm very happy that he does express himself. He's only been in the baptized for six months. He has zeal. Maybe the other person will say, yeah, but he'll burn himself out in time. But we're not interested in, in him burning himself out. The elders are interested in that person to keep his zeal strong, his faith strong, his love strong, his work of preaching the good news alive. And that's what every other one in the congregation ought to be anxious to do. Sometimes there are individuals in the congregation we never want to speak to. And if we find that in regards to ourselves, we are not very long in spirit. We do not have long suffering. Let's just read a few scriptures from the Bible and see what the, the apostle wrote in this regard in Ephesians 4, 2, and 3. There, uh, we should keep this in mind, that we should have complete lowliness of mind and mildness. Now, it just doesn't stop there. The apostle had something else in mind, too. He said, complete lowliness of mind and mildness with long suffering, putting up with one another in love. So probably the Apostle Paul saw the Ephesians have the same problem, that they were short in their own spirit toward their brothers and sisters in the congregation. So he tells him, you want to be complete, uh, have complete lowliness of mind, and has mildness with long suffering, putting up with one another in love, earnestly endeavoring to observe the oneness of the Spirit in the uniting bond of peace. And this is something that you find all over the world in Jehovah's Theocratic Organization, a bond of peace. And it's that uh, love that all of Jehovah's Witnesses have for one another that uh, is bringing them together and holding them together as one organization. And no matter what tongue is spoken, no matter what tribe people come from, no matter what nation they are in, we find that all of these people have come into the spiritual paradise and they're enjoying the truth as Jehovah God has expressed it through his word. This delights us, and this is what brings about the unity in the organization. And then again, there's a scripture in Colossians, the first chapter, verses 10 and 11. There we read that we should walk worthily of Jehovah to the end of fully pleasing him as you go on bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the accurate knowledge of God, being made powerful with all power to the extent of his glorious might, so as to endure fully and be long-suffering with joy. Now, there's a lot we could talk about in just this one text. That we are to walk worthily with Jehovah. Well, that's the same thing that our basic text is on this evening, working together with him always Jehovah God, and here we are to walk worthily of Jehovah. Now many years ago, uh, the Corinthians had a problem. This the fine young man from Alexander came up there to Corinth, and the Corinthians saw him, and uh, oh, when he speaks it's just wonderful. So I'm going to stick with Apollo. I like him. He's a fine man. I like to be on with him. But that fellow Paul, when he talks, he's sharp, 
he touched her. The words he uses, uh, uh, they always dig into my side. So I'm, I'm with Apollo. Other people say, well, I like the way Paul said it. And so there was a certain amount of division. Someone said, well, I'm for Apollo, I'm for Paul. But Paul told to the Corinthians on this matter, and he says, we're all one in Christ. So we are not the following Apollos, we're not following Paul, we're not following any man. Now all of us have a work to do. We're doing the same work that Christ Jesus did when he was upon the earth, and all that Apollos and I are doing is planting and watering. And that's all of you Corinthians are doing the same thing. All we're doing is planting and we're watering. We're working together with God. But remember, it's God that makes it grow. So we don't make it grow. It's God that makes it grow. It's his spirit, his power, his word. Your association, our association, their association, with Jehovah's organization that he had developed. And as we work together with God and we plant and we water, God will make it grow. There's no reason why any of us should take any credit to ourselves or any of the accomplishments that we see on the earth today. This is God's work. And we have a wonderful privilege of working together with God in seeing that it's done. And Paul saw back there that there would be problems. And in our walking together with Jehovah, we want to be pleasing to him. We want to go on bearing fruit of every good work. We want to increase in our accurate knowledge of God. As individuals in Jehovah's theocratic organization, we want to be made powerful with all power to the extent of his glorious might, enduring fully no matter what happens, and be long suffering with joy. So if someone in your congregation irritates you every time you sit down there in the congregation, stop a minute and think, now what am I supposed to do? I know I'm working with Jehovah. That's my whole desire, my salvation. I want to live, and this is the acceptable time because I'm alive. So does that person over there. I have to endure his comments, but I'm not going to be disturbed about them. I uh, don't like the cut of his hair, but I'm not going to be irritated over that. I don't like the language some of the people use in the congregation when they make their comments, but I am not going to let that bother me. So I am going to endure fully and be long-suffering with joy. I'm going to enjoy the Watchtower study, the service meeting, the Theocratic Ministry School, the whole blessing that God pours out upon the congregation. I'm going to enjoy it. Even though things occur that might irritate me or disturb me a bit, I'm not going to show it. I'm going to keep in mind what Proverbs 14.29 says. He that is slow to anger is abundant in discernment, but one that is impatient is exalting foolishness. So while we're sitting there in the congregation and somebody is speaking that irritates us, let's all of a sudden think of Proverbs 14.29 I'm going to be slow to anger because if I am slow to anger, I'll be abundant in discernment and I'll be able to hear what that person says. I'll be able to listen to everyone else in the congregation. I'll enjoy the comments of the conductor. I'm going to get a spiritual blessing out of this meeting because I have longness of spirit. We might also read Proverbs 25, 28. As a city broken through without a wall is the man that has no restraint for his spirit. For his spirit. We can't control ourselves. 
we're going to get irritated, angry. That's like a wall, uh, like a city without a wall. So do we want the full protection of Jehovah God by having full control of our spirit and have this fruit of the spirit that God wants all of us to have, one of which is long suffering? But we want all the others too. But this long suffering has to do with the congregation and our dealing with one another. Another scripture, Proverbs 29, 11, all his spirit is what a stupid one lets out. But he that is wise keeps it calm to the land. He just isn't going to be disturbed. So if we have control of our spirit, or our spirit is long, there is longness of our spirit, we will be able to put up with a lot of things that our brothers and sisters might do in the congregation that really are none of our business. So we'll just be quiet and calm to the last. There are elders in the congregation, there are ministerial servants, they have the responsibility, and if there's anything going wrong within the congregation, then it's their responsibility for God to shepherd the flock of God. And if we do not have this responsibility, then we'll just keep our spirit calm. And even if we are an elder and are doing shepherding work and we feel it is necessary to speak to someone in the congregation, we might as well do it with calmness of spirit. One more scripture on this point is found in Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter and the ninth verse. Do not hurry yourself in your spirit to become offended. For the taking of offense is what rests in the bosom of the stupid one. So there is absolutely no reason for us to get all excited when somebody speaks up at the congregation that doesn't use language the way we think he should, or says something that might irritate us. Do not hurry yourself in your spirit in your power, your force of expression, do not hurry yourself in your spirit, become offended. Sit there calmly, listen to what he has to say, and enjoy the comment and the fellowship of the whole congregation of God. You might read also Colossians 3.13, which says, Continue putting up with one another and forgiving one another freely. If anyone has a cause to complain against another, even if Jehovah freely forgave you, so do you also. Now to make it very clear that there is a real distinction between long-suffering and persecution, I would like you to read along with me Second Timothy, the third chapter, verses 10 to 12. There Paul is writing his second letter to Timothy on the matter of observing Paul's way of life. And Timothy had a wonderful opportunity of observing Paul. He traveled with him. And so Paul writes this, But you have closely followed my teaching, my course of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my love, my endurance, my persecution, my sufferings, the sort of things that happened to me in Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystia, the sort of persecutions I have borne, and yet out of them all the Lord delivered me. In fact, all those desiring to live with God the devotion in association with Christ Jesus will also be persecuted. Now you notice there, Paul in writing to Timothy said that he should observe, you have observed closely, my long suffering, and you've also observed closely my persecution. Uh, Paul 
I wasn't using the same word twice, it's two different Greek words. What had to do with the problems that uh, he put up with in the congregation? And the other had to do with the problems he put up with the peoples of the world and the persecution and hardship that came upon him from the devil's organization. Well, there's no question about Paul putting up with some long-suffering. Remember the drama last summer that we had at the convention? Paul was talking to some of the Gentile Christians. Peter was there talking to the Jewish Christians. And one of the Jewish Christians comes over and asks Peter to dine with them that evening, have supper with them, and bring all of your Jewish friends along. Oh, Peter, oh, oh I, I couldn't do that. Oh, I, I have other things, other engagements, I am occupied. The Gentile Christians couldn't understand this, even though he was asked several times, and bring your friends with you, your, your brothers, your Jewish circumcised brothers. Well, Paul could have been observing all this, as we observed the drama, we didn't see Paul just dashing in there in a hurry and telling Peter off. But the Christian Gentile brother goes to Paul and asks him, how is it that when Peter comes up here and visits us and all of these Jewish friends of his that are not with him, why he'll sit down and he'll eat everything we put on the table. He's always hungry and eats well. But now when these Jewish circumcised Jews are with him, he won't even sit down at the table with them. I can't understand it. Well, oh, Paul may have observed this, and he may have had to endure a little bit of long-suffering there at Peter, his brother, an apostle. So he went over to Peter and wanted to know how come. When you visit the Gentiles up here, you eat dinner with them and have supper with them. Don't you know, Peter, that there is nothing to circumcision and nothing to uncircumcision? There is neither Jew nor Gentile. We are all one in Christ. Now, how is it that you and your Jewish companions here can't come and eat with these Gentiles? Well, of course, uh, Paul was an elder. And he was talking to one of the apostles, one of the twelve. And uh, Peter saw the error of his way. And he said, yes, I'll come and I'll bring all of my Jewish brothers with me. But here something goes on that Paul and the Gentile Christians had to endure, had to show some long suffering. And they kept their spirit calm until the end. By doing so, they all ate together. But there are things that do irritate within the congregation of God. And it must have, back there in the days of Paul and Peter and the other apostles visiting the early members of the congregation, and they were the anointed ones too. They were in line for the high calling to be associated with Christ Jesus. So there is a difference between long suffering and also that of persecution. But we can be sure as the time goes on, and the devil's organization uh, moves ahead to, in its way of destruction, and wanting to see everybody that is on God's side persecuted. But there will be a lot of uh, integrity that we will have to show towards God and show him that no matter what happens to us personally from the outside, we're going to be loyal and true to him, and no matter what happens within the organization itself, we're going to be true and faithful. And we will earnestly endeavor to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, which are love and faith and joy and long-suffering, mildness, self-control, and these other things that we see constantly developing within all of these people that are coming into Jehovah's organization today. It is marvelous to see how strong, spiritually, the organization of God is. And Brother Franz and I and those who traveled with us had a wonderful opportunity during these past seven uh, weeks or more 
in traveling around the world to see the strength that is in the brothers in the various parts of the earth. They're having wonderful increases. They've enjoyed themselves very much in the service just as you are doing here. When we left New York on a Friday night and uh, flew to Portugal, we had an all-night flight and got there early in the morning on Portuguese time. And the first thing the branch service told us there was something very wonderful had happened. The ban against Jehovah's Witnesses had now been lifted. Well, this delighted us very, very much. That all happened just three days before we arrived, so it was all good news to us. Well, to tell you a little bit about the story, back in 1971, the dictatorial government of Portugal was forced almost to make some changes in the Constitution, and they did show in the Constitution that you could have a religious association. Well, by November the 14th, 1972, there were 500 brothers that were working under ban that filed a petition with the government, signing their name and address, saying that we are Jehovah's Witnesses and we want to be recognized as a religious society in this country. That was a very bold step to make on the part of 500 people. They all could have been picked up by the secret police and put it to prison because they declared themselves as such. Because Jehovah's Witnesses were still banned. But taking an advantage of a clause in the Constitution, they applied for an association of Jehovah's Witnesses. Month after month, our lawyer who was working on this matter for us in Portugal, will you recall in reading the newspapers about a year ago, there was a revolution in Portugal the army took over, they put in new government officials, they took those who had been dictating and ruling for 45 years out, and a new government was formed and a new constitution. And as soon as that happened, our brothers followed right through on the charter that was in the government office. So they found the charter again and said we would like this to be put through. Now that we have a new constitution, a new form of government, we would like to carry on worship uh, according to our way and belief. Well, the government said there's a new constitution and what has been written was in harmony with the last, but it isn't in harmony with ours. So rewrite it, fix it up, and bring it back. Our lawyers got to work along with our brothers and fixed it up according to the new constitution and filed it. The government checked it over. They authenticated it. And then after that, it had to be published in the largest newspaper in Portugal. So we had to rent space or buy space in the newspaper and publish our whole charter. What Jehovah's Witnesses believe, what they're going to do, what their whole purpose in life was, about preaching the good news of the kingdom and going from house to house and helping people understand the Bible. All this is published. And we want to be an association recognized by the government. Well, after it's published in the principal newspaper, and other newspapers picked it up all over the country and published the same thing on their own, because this was news. Jehovah's Witnesses are working underground for years. And now they come out in the open on a full-page advertisement that we want to be an association recognized by the government. Well, a few days later, the government also had to publish the whole thing, just it was in the newspaper. And when it is published in these two papers, a principal paper in Lisbon and the government gazette, then you take your evidence that it's been published, all the country has been notified that we want to be a religious organization, and you file it. Of course, that gives everybody in the country an opportunity to object. But when they took it to the Justice Department, there were no objections then yet. So the lawyer just told him, he said, well, now there is the compliance with the law. We've done everything, so give us our certificate. It took a little persuasion on the part of the lawyer. There were some men in government there that were still very good Catholics that thought, well, 
don't want to let Jehovah's Witnesses get on the book. Maybe next February we can uh, look into this matter. We're very busy right now. Our lawyer was an elderly man, looked mild, and he said to these men in government, Either you give us our receipt this afternoon, or your names will be on the front page of all the newspapers tomorrow morning, and I'll put them there. Well, we've complied with the law. It's been published in the newspapers. It's been published in the government gazette. Now, all you have to do is to give us a receipt saying that we are an association of Jehovah's Witnesses in Portugal. And he got us. And that was three days before we arrived. Well, the new constitution allowed for public meetings for a lecture to be given. And even before we arrived, the branch there uh, arranged for a meeting in Porto where Brother Franz and I were to speak, although they were not told in Porto who was coming. They just said there was going to be a lecture in a large basketball stadium. And so they sent letters to 2,000 or 200 Jehovah's Witnesses in that area. So that afternoon when Brother Franz and I gave our talk, we found that the stadium was packed right up to the ceiling, very much like this, but much smaller. But there were 7,586 brothers and sisters and people who studied the Bible with them there in the auditorium. That night we flew to uh, Lisbon, and uh, our brothers had been uh, praying that it did not rain. In fact, uh, we had a little meeting with all the missionaries in Portugal after the whole thing was over. And one person, one of the missionaries, had written a little poetry on the theme, Oh no, don't let it rain, you know that song. Well anyway, they wrote this and they were singing it to themselves that they didn't want it to rain. Well it was the rainy season. And it didn't rain Saturday. Sunday morning we got up and everything was covered with uh, fog, heavy mist. By noon this mist raised up. And uh, then we went to the stadium that all the brothers were notified uh, where a meeting was going to be held in Lisbon at a football stadium on Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And when we got out there, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And uh, we parked the car uh, right close to the stadium, but we had to go through heavy crowds of people even to get the car there. And when we walked inside the stadium about 20 minutes before 3, every seat was filled. All the stadium was filled. And uh, people were standing on the track. I had my camera and was very enthusiastic about this matter and seeing so many people there in this football stadium. Because I remember years ago when Brother Franz and I would visit Portugal, we always met in a basement or an attic with all the shades down. We'd go to the meetings around 10 or 11 o'clock at night and talk until 12 or 1 in the morning. Everything was done underground, secretly. And here we are in a big stadium. The office had sent out information to 11,000 brothers in that area that there would be a meeting at 3 o'clock in the football stadium there in Lisbon. Well, there were tears in other people's eyes. Jehovah's Witnesses, who had been preaching for a long time underground and going from house to house, many of them had been arrested for it, though. But there they were, sitting in that audience and seeing this great crowd of people standing all around the track. They couldn't go on the grass; it was forbidden. But there were tears in their eyes to think that so many people would come out. And finally it was three o'clock and there were still people coming and still people outside. And while Brother Franz was talking, the brothers in charge of the work there went to see the manager again and 
said there are thousands of people that can't get in. They're outside there. You can see them. Nobody's on the grass. We've done just what you told us, but please, let our people walk out on the grass far enough so that all these other people can get inside and hear the two speakers this afternoon. And they argued with them kindly, pleaded with them, and finally the manager said, may it be God's will. So the brothers started to move in on the grass. And they got closer and closer to Brother Friends, who was speaking up there, giving his talk to this very great audience. And then after he was finished, I got up and speak, uh, spoke to them. And at the close of the talk, the brother just put a little piece of paper on the stand and told me how many were there. So I was able to tell that great audience that Sunday afternoon in Lisbon, there were 39,284 in attendance. Well, I know when I got on that platform and tried to get started to speak, there was a great big lump in here I had to get rid of. I tried to swallow it a couple of times. But uh, it's truly amazing. Wonderful what God has done. There were 14,220 publishers in Portugal, as reported in December, and we had 46,870 of those two meetings on that Saturday afternoon and Sunday. This is something that God is doing. So you begin to think, here it is, 1975 service year, late in December. The new year, 1975, is going to start according to this calendar. What has God done? Has he opened up this whole field of Portugal now to bring in tens of thousands of people? After they have been working so hard on the ground, all of a sudden now the society is recognized, the brothers are getting uh, stores and uh, lofts and apartments, they're opening up kingdom halls. We're getting a, a house where we hope to establish a branch office and put a sign on the front door to hold his witnesses of Portugal. And people will know where we are. This is us. And we're all over the country already. Now, why did Jehovah God do this? Well, we believe that Jehovah had as much to do with that as he did with Spain just a few years before. He wanted to open it up so that a great crowd of people could be brought into his organization. Remember what Jesus said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, these also I must gather. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. And you could feel that in Portugal. We got on the plane, the next morning, and we just sat out on our seats, and the rain came. Well, we felt the Lord was with us again all day Saturday and Sunday, and kept the rain. Oh no, don't let the rain come down. So I think the prayers were answered. Well, we went on to Spain, and there they had arranged in advance to have a large bull ring in which we could talk on December the 25th. It was all arranged, and we've used the bull ring a number of times in uh, Barcelona. But just a little while before, the government sent no, notice that we could not use the bull ring because it didn't seem proper to them that a Christian meeting should be held in a bull ring on Christmas Day. Well, it was a rather weak excuse, but anyway, we didn't get the bull ring on Christmas Day, but our brothers did arrange to have a meeting in a large, unfinished factory, which they are trying to buy for their own assembly hall in Barcelona. So we were able to speak to 5,044 beginning at noon on Christmas Day in Barcelona. But the wonderful thing about Spain, a couple of years ago, the work all opened up there too. About four or five years ago, we filed with the government of Spain when 
they changed some things in the Constitution, that we could have a society of Jehovah's Witnesses in Spain. And they opened it up to all religions. And so we filed, and we were about the last one to be recognized, but when we were recognized, our brothers went right out and got lost, signed contracts or leases for 10 years or more, and they remodeled these buildings, and they have uh, about 80 and 90 kingdom halls throughout Spain now, and three and four congregations use these kingdom halls in all of the large cities. But today, they have 29,042 publishers in Spain, and they're growing fast every month. Now, does God have anything to do with maneuvering things in that country so that in these last days a great crowd of people who speak the Spanish tongue in that country of Spain might have the opportunity of coming into the truth. Now we can go from door to door, work on the streets with magazines, and we can tell the people, now is the day of salvation. Now is especially for the acceptable time. And today, 29,000 people are working together with God, preaching the good news of God's kingdom. Well, something very interesting happened in France just about this same time, or a month or two before. The Watchtower magazine has been banned in France for about 14 or 15 years. And uh, we did get the message of the Watchtower to our brothers in France, but we just couldn't get the Watchtower magazine through. We did get the Awake magazine in, and that was used uh, widely throughout France, and our brothers in France have 13 magazines per congregation publisher in France, and they only have the two issues a month, not four. They also were allowed to have all of the bound books come in, but the Watchtower was banned because they believed that was the thing that controlled all the people of France that were Jehovah's Witnesses. But uh, France grew, they have 50,000 publishers today. But when the president, when the elections were coming up, there was one man that gave strong speeches for freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of the press. And people in France were allowed to express their beliefs. This is one of his strong platforms. And uh, he happened to be elected. So when he was elected, uh, I suggested to the Paris office that the French society, which we have in France, uh, write a very nice letter to the new president, reminding him of some of the things that he said during his campaign, and bring to his attention again that the watchtower was banned, and uh, would he make arrangements to lift the ban off that magazine, which has worldwide distribution. He acknowledged the letter and said he would look into the matter. And two months later, in the government newspaper, like our congressional record, Paris uh, Paper Gazette of the government, there was a little notice. And there it says, ban against the watchtower was all in French. The ban against the watchtower is lifted, and the police shall see to it that this magazine can have free distribution anywhere in France and all of the French territory in the world. Well, of course, of course, this made our brothers in France very happy. Immediately, when they read this in the French Gazette, the government newspaper, they phoned Switzerland, where we print the Watchtower. We set it there and print it and send it to other parts of the world, to French-speaking territories, but we could never send it into France. And so they ordered immediately on the next printing or whatever is on the press, and you print it to 110,000 copies. It happened that the February 1st issue was on the press, and they printed an extra 110,000 copies, put them on a truck and delivered them right to the Paris office. The next uh, edition was raised to 220,000, 
And now the Switzerland office has an order from Paris for 330,000 copies for April. So they're going to give the Watchtower wide distribution throughout France, just the same as the Awake and all the other publications have. Now, here we see the maneuvering of a nation in Portugal. We see the maneuvering of governments in Spain. We see the maneuvering or changing of governments in France. And all of this has been for the benefit of God's people. We appreciate this very much. But it makes you stop and think, Jehovah God is all-powerful, and he is doing things today for the benefit of his people to get a work done. And we believe he's giving us time to get that work done. When we think back in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, Jehovah God used that nation to take over Jerusalem and destroy the temple. He prophesied that there would be another great ruler, Cyrus, come forth. And that prophecy came true, and the Medo-Persians brought down Babylon. And then the prophecies of Daniel show that Greece would come to the fore and describe quite in detail Alexander the Great and the way his government divided itself in the four divisions. And then after that, uh, we see Rome coming to the fore, and since then the Anglo-American Empire and then the League of Nations all prophesied years ago and God's purpose and his maneuvering of things brings about his purpose. Now can we think and believe that God is now maneuvering nations right here on this earth at this time so that this great crowd might be more easily gathered by those who are thoroughly devoted to Jehovah God and have dedicated their life to him. When we went on to Germany, we believe that there is a lot of work yet to be done, and we're planning for things to move right on through, right up until that great tribulation breaks. We're not going to stop and slow down and say, well, maybe, maybe not. No, we're not thinking of time as far as preaching is concerned. God has an organization and we're all working together with him and we're progressive. So in West Germany and Wiesbaden we're building a new four-story Bethel home. And there we're prepared to bring in 90 more people, young men, women, to manufacture magazines, books and books, booklets. Recently, when I was over there, I arranged to buy a large building across the street from our present property. Those people have now moved out, and we're putting in a lot of new machinery. By the end of 1975, this service year in which we are, if it be Jehovah's will, we hope to print uh, 10 million bound books in Germany itself. They will be supplying all of the German literature for Central Europe, they print for the Scandinavian countries, for Holland, and now they're going to take on printing for Italy and France. But the work is growing. We see it opening up in different parts of Europe. We went on to, what well, I might say, while we were in West Germany, we had a very fine meeting on a Friday evening in a large hall there, and there were 22,875 people in attendance. Then we went on down to Switzerland for a few days. There was a lot of work to be done there in regards to erecting a new building on our present property, enlarging our present factory, because the work has been expanding throughout all of Europe, and Switzerland has been very busy there, just bulging, even though we built the factory just five years ago. But when you see that in six years, a million people have come in the truth, and nobody told us in advance, but we see them coming now, but we have been thinking ahead and building and preparing for increase, and we've been able to keep up with it by Jehovah's help. But we bought more property than we really needed at the time, thinking if we have to expand, we will. Last summer, we decided to expand and put up a new three-story building adjacent to the one we have, putting everything on the property now that the city authorities will allow. 
And we had a very nice meeting with our brothers in Tune, 563 on the Sunday evening. The next day we were off early <laughs> for Italy. And no sooner did we arrive than they had a meeting ready for us there in a large sports arena. And they had it packed to the roof too. 17,274 were in attendance. But in Italy, we're growing. I remember going there in 1947, I believe it was, when I went around the world the other way for the first time, visiting all the branches I could after the war had ended. And I got to Rome, and uh, a brother met me, took me to the hotel, and we arranged for a meeting in the hotel room that I had. And there were 15 people that came to the meeting in Rome back in 1947. There were other people in the truth in other cities, but not very many. They were very badly persecuted during the war. But today, there are 45,866 publishers throughout all of Italy. The work is just booming in that land. And we're very happy for this. They're getting about 1,000 new publishers every month. As was pointed out uh, earlier, I showed that in Italy last year, in the first three months, they baptized 782. Now in the first three months, 1,889. We did build a new branch in Italy recently, but it is much too small now because of this very fast and unusual growth. The government of Rome, however, will not allow us to go above ground. So we're very apt at building underground. So uh, they have given us permission to make a very large underground room. So we're excavating now alongside of our present building, and we're putting in a tremendous basement. And after it's all built, we'll cover the top over with sod and uh, grow some grass there, and we'll really be underground then. But uh, that's not all. There's some very fine property right behind our present property. And uh, while I was there, we investigated this owner and the price and other things. And I just got a letter in Hawaii saying that uh, the branch there bought the property right behind our present property. So we can put up a very large uh, building. We bought about nine acres of land right out there next to our own property and someday if it be Jehovah's will and we have to do our own printing we have the ground now to expand on a great degree but it seems as though God is giving us more time to gather maybe a hundred thousand or more of Italians into the truth well we had a delightful uh, meeting there with 17,274 and moved on to Greece. Well, every time we've gone to Greece and years gone by, it was working more or less underground. We'd go to people's houses, maybe 10 or 15 houses in a day, and we'd talk to small groups of 20, 30, sometimes as high as 50. But our work is not acknowledged in Greece as a legitimate organization. For a while, we had the privilege of performing marriages there, but now they say any marriage performed by Jehovah's Witnesses, all the children are illegitimate. They don't even register them in the uh, birth books anymore. The uh, Greek Orthodox Church there is uh, very hard on Jehovah's Witnesses, and they're trying to slow it down, but they can't. We reached a new peak in December in Greece of 17,551. So the people are hearing what we have to say, we can't openly go from house to house, but we can carry on a tremendous number of Bible studies, and they are doing that. Well, we heard good news when we arrived in Greece. They told us they had, uh, due to a change of government, the dictatorial uh, military coup that took place about five years ago was now out. A new, more democratic government was in power. And they were allowing the people to hold lectures. So the branch office arranged for two lectures, one on uh, Saturday morning and one on Saturday evening. 
in a basketball stadium. It would seat about 4,000. So we anticipated between eight and 10,000 people would come there, and Brother Franz and I would be able to talk to them. And that, and that made our hearts glad to think that we could see uh, 4,000 of our brothers at one time, or maybe 5,000 really packed out. Well, on Friday afternoon, a phone call came through to the office that of the stadium was canceled. So happened that one of the boards of directors was a nephew of the archbishop, and he got uh, a notice or a chastisement or something. I don't know what it was anyway. You can't use it. It was canceled out, and we couldn't uh, use it. But our brothers in Greece were not at all dismayed. Brothers were coming from all over Greece to attend this meeting. So the brothers got a hold of a brother who has a hotel. It was closed for the winter, but uh, he was quite happy to open it up. And our brothers went out there that night and cleaned the hotel, got all the chairs out of the dining rooms and other places, Build all the space of chairs and took truckloads of chairs there. And every place where you could put a chair, there was a place for someone to sit. When we got down there on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, the stairways were solid. The three floors up, there were loud speakers put in the stairways. The hallways on all the floors were solid with chairs. A lot uh, television at each end of the hallway were three floors up. Every place where people could sit in that hotel uh, was being used. In the first meeting we had on Saturday morning, there were 2,411. This program went on all day, from 9 o'clock on Saturday morning to 9.30 Saturday night. We spoke to four audiences. The total was over 8,900. They arranged then for Monday morning with another basketball stadium, and uh, we had a Monday morning meeting. It turned out to be a... Greek holiday, and there were 2,700 there. That was packed out. So in the five meetings that we had in Greece, we were able to talk to 11,644. So here again, <laughs> so here again we see maneuvering. We see some power beyond our sight. That is arranging things for God's people to have greater freedom. And while I was there, I was working with an architect uh, to build another new Bethel home in Greece, because our present one is too small. And it's so designed that there will be a printing plant, a branch office, a Bethel home, and a large lecture hall. And uh, these plans are now filed with the city of Athens, and we feel sure that we'll get permission to build it. In a month or two now, the government of Greece is going to write up a new constitution. And the people of Greece feel confident that there will be freedom of speech and freedom of worship in that constitution. And of course, we are praying for that ourselves, so that we will have a freer course to spread the good news of the kingdom in our, throughout that land. If they do give it this freedom, I'm sure that you will see Greece move ahead just about as fast as Spain, Portugal, Italy, all of Europe, and probably thousands of more people, tens of thousands of more people, will be coming into the truth during the 1975 year. How many more years Jehovah God is going to have us work together with him in this particular work? of preaching the good news of the kingdom before the great tribulation breaks, we don't know. But it certainly seems to me that uh, God is doing something for our benefit. Right here in the United States, look what's happening. With the tens of thousands last year, uh, 65,000 people baptized, and this year so far, the first three months, 15,000 people baptized, more than the same period last year. Things are happening all over the world in this great endeavor. Other sheep I have, which are not of this little flock, and these also I must gather. So things are happening. But that doesn't mean that every place in the world is easy going. It isn't. In 
good, hard fight, a steady drive on the part of Jehovah's Witnesses and efforts, trusting in Jehovah to get things done. Our next stop was in Asia, in Lebanon. There we couldn't speak to all of our brothers. There was a ban against us in the Watchtower of Adam Track Society. And so we can't uh, have meetings in the open. However, Brother Franz and I were able to speak to 85 of the elders in uh, Tripoli and 143 of the elders in Beirut. We saw some of the other brothers. We visited with the missionaries. And they're still working, even though the work is bad. So I spoke to Brother Nasrallah, who is one of the missionaries over there from the United States. I said, well, how do you get along? Oh, he says, fine. I said, well, with the ban on, how do you just carry on your work? Do people ever try to stop you or take you to jail, or what do you do? Well, he said, we go from door to door with just the Bible, nothing else. We don't have a tract or a book or a magazine or anything on our person. We just have the Bible. We use that only. So I said, uh, how do you go about your witnessing? Well, he said, we use the sermons just like you do in the United States or any other part of the world and try to interest the people in Bible study. He said, once in a while you go to a door and the person will say to you, well, uh, you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, aren't you? Yes, I am. Well, isn't the society banned? And we very kindly say yes. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is banned here in London. But I am not. I am one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm a Christian. And I'm working just like Christ Jesus did when he was upon the earth. He went from place to place and talked. And that's all I'm doing. If you're interested in the Bible, I'd be very happy to talk to you about it. So while the society is banned, I as an individual am not banned from talking the truth to other people. Come in. And they have lots of Bible studies going. So they keep going back on these studies maybe five or six times, and when they find that people are really interested and want to know more about our work and they inquire about the society, and how it's worked all over the world, and we know they want to become one of Jehovah's Witnesses, then a book appears. Then they start a regular book study with the individual, and it isn't long until they come into the truth. And as I say, there were 1,832 publishers in December, a new peak. So the work just keeps on going underground or above ground, whichever country you're in. Next country we went to was Pakistan, and here we certainly showed our admiration for our missionaries. Probably this is one of the hardest territories in the world that anyone is working in. But our missionaries are one bit discouraged. We've had missionaries in Pakistan for over 25 years, and in those 25 years, they have a total number, including the missionaries, of 150 publishers in that land. Well, you'd think uh, that would be quite discouraging. But they weren't. They were saying, Brother Noah, this has been a wonderful year for us. 1974 service year, we had 17 people baptized in this country. That's the second time that high a number were baptized in Pakistan. And do you know what? We just had a circuit assembly, and with that circuit assembly, in the first four months of this year, we've had 17 baptized. And their zeal on 17 people is as much as yours for 15 or 20 in your own congregation getting baptized. But they're delighted. They're not discouraged. They feel if Jehovah God wants to bring people out of that country before this great tribulation, they're there to do it. And they're sticking with it, and we certainly were proud of them. We had a meeting. In Karachi, 197 were in attendance that night. That's more than they have uh, publishers in the whole land. Just in this one city of Karachi, 197. We had a delightful time. And their zeal, their love for God, was truly an inspiration to all of us who were traveling. We went on to India. It's another hard country in which to work, but there's progress. Uh, a lot of people taking up the uh, pioneer work. 
down in the Malayalam language, uh, land where they speak that uh, tongue. Uh, they have 78 people that have come out and gone into the pioneer work. And that territory is getting real coverage. They have 4,494 publishers in all of India now in New Peak in December. And we have the privilege of speaking to 948 in Bombay. We build an assembly hall on the roof of our branch office. There are scarcity of halls in Bombay, so the society just took over the whole roof, made it into a large hall and it seats 450. But when Brother Franz and I were there, they crowded in 948. Of course, that included all the stairway and the driveway to the garage outside, which is handled by loudspeakers. But we had a wonderful time with our brothers in India. And I recall Brother Skinner, maybe some of you know him. He went over there, I believe it was in 1924, in there ever since. And he is just delighted with the progress that is being shown in that country with the millions and millions of people. So their hopes are high. Our next stop was Burma. And we had a bit of a disappointment there like we had in, uh, in uh, Spain and also in Greece. But it didn't dampen the zeal of the brothers. They had arranged for a three-day district uh, circuit assembly while we were all there. We were all scheduled on the program each day. But when we arrived, the government canceled our assembly hall because of the riot on the part of the students in connection with Utah burial in that country. There was a curfew put on at 10 o'clock at night, and uh, everybody had to be indoors or get shot if you were walking because they had the army out. But it didn't slow us down. Instead of having the meeting in the big hall that they arranged for, the first night we went to the Kingdom Hall and that was packed. And Brother Franz and I were able to speak to 270. But the street was full too. They had to tell the brothers who were waiting in the street, well, you better go home so that no disturbance occurs on the part of the army. But tomorrow we'll go to another place. His sister had offered her home, and she had a big yard around her home, a little bit outside the city. And the next day, there were 435 in attendance there, and the third day, there were 650. And we had a delightful time together with our Burmese brothers and sisters. They had a 14% increase this year already, with a new peak of 767. So in Burma, the land, the work is going ahead. In Thailand, we've had missionaries there, maybe 40 or more, for uh, the last 25, 27 years. And uh, it's been very slow. Up until last January, not this year, but 1974, January, they had 500 publishers with all this hard work that they've been doing. But they were very pleased to say that in 12 months, 105 new people came out and established themselves and dedicated their lives to God and began publishing. We had a fine meeting there in Bangkok with 469. So even in this country that is steeped in Buddhism, the same as Burma, the people are listening. There is a time of change. The government is giving our brothers more freedom to talk and uh, carry on meetings, and they're taking a hold. And these missionaries in these various countries have real confidence that something is going to happen because of the slight change and more people coming in uh, to them with great rapidity, but not in the numbers that we see in other parts of the world. But this is a time when this great crowd is being gathered together from all nations, kindreds, and tongues. Then we went south to Malaysia. And there we packed out the Kingdom Hall out into the yard. 226 were in attendance. But in December they had a new peak tour of 370. We have a certain amount of freedom in Malaysia. We're not exactly banned. We do operate. We have Kingdom Halls. We meet together. But the watchtower is not permitted to come in. However, some do get in through the mail. We went on down to Singapore. And there, of course, as you know, we are definitely banned. The watchtower property was seized, the Kingdom Hall was padlocked, and uh, we just can't have meetings publicly anymore. Uh, however, it hasn't stopped our work at all in Singapore. 
And on Sunday morning, all of the brothers that uh, were traveling went out in the field service with our Chinese the brothers and sisters in Singapore from house to house. And they do it just like in Pakistan. They work only with the Bible. No other evidence that they're associated with the Pakistan Bible and Tax Society at all. And the people listen. They have some very fine studies. Their big problem is they don't have enough congregations. They have four now. I had the privilege of speaking to all of their elders. And I suggested that instead of having four, they have four now. I had the privilege of speaking to all of their elders. And I suggested that instead of having four congregations, you break it down to six and to put two elders in each congregation. They have 18 ministerial servants. I suggested use these ministerial servants and put three in each congregation. Make your meetings in your private home smaller so that there'll just be 10 people meeting together instead of 20 or 25 because that's illegal. So they're going to reorganize now and more people will be coming to their meetings but it'll only be 9 or 10. If there's 10 people in a house talking together, there's no law that you're violating. But when you have 20 people in a home, that is a violation of law. So they're working in harmony with the law and keeping their meetings small and they're spreading out their congregations wider, but that doesn't mean there's 10 in the congregation. They have maybe uh, 40 or 50 people in each congregation, so they have to have five or six individual meetings, individual service meetings, individual theocratic schools, public meetings. All this is handled in small groups and those elders are kept in, and the Ministry of Service. There are 292 publishers in Singapore now. That's a new peak in December. And uh, Brother Franz and I were able to speak to three groups at two different places. The brothers there rented from the government, government houses where people go for a vacation. So they rented the houses from the government. And then they had meetings. We just had a big picnic. And at three big picnics, we had 431 people present. Of course, we had a lot of things to eat, soda pop, uh, just general conversation. But uh, Brother Franz and I were able to give full talk to these groups. They all came into the house then, in this government house. We talked, but they're full of zeal. They're happy, they're delighted. The prospects of the work in Singapore are great because they have so many studies and so many people came out to hear us at the three meetings we have. Indonesia is going along fine. That was our next stop. We're building an addition to our present branch office there. We had a meeting with 2,175 in a basketball stadium. And they now have a new peak of 4,062 in Indonesia. We went to Australia and they had a very fine assembly hall that they used on one of the evenings we were there. They built their own. Very nice. We had 1,736 in attendance. But Australia now is just like any other branch of the country in the world, like the United States. They have their own printing press. They print the Watchdown, the Wake magazine, other printing for the country. And they're doing fine with nearly 28,000 publishers in Australia. New Zealand, we had a very lovely time with a meeting of 2,866 in the town hall. We packed it out. There was just no more room. In fact, the attendants closed the doors and we finally persuaded them to open up a dining room. And then they left the people outside to meet and sit in the dining room connected with a loudspeaker. And that was a very fine attendance, the biggest they ever had in that hall. 2866, but they have 7,107 publishers in New Zealand. They're having a very fine time from one end of the island to the other, north to the south. We went to Tahiti. That was our next stop on our way home. And there we were delighted to find uh, 740 Tahitians gathered together in an auditorium on a Sunday afternoon. We went and saw three different kingdom halls that the Tahitian brothers had built. Sometimes you think of these small islands as just a few people and not work, much work being done. But they have 228 publishers down there on that island of Tahiti. And they're reaching out to other islands. We learned while we were there that 
They have eight congregations organized, all in French, and they go out to other islands by boat, which uh, work with them as a separate organization because it's all French. So they, we know there's a potential of 740 because that's how many people attended our meeting on a Sunday afternoon. Our next stop was Hawaii, and of course, there they're doing marvels. I remember going there many years ago and dedicating New Kingdom Hall, and we'd go to these halls and everybody that went there would sleep on the floor. Next day we'd have a big meeting, a public meeting and a dedication. But now, everywhere you go in Hawaii, there are publics. Uh, we had a meeting at the Shell uh, there in Honolulu, and there were 6,235 in attendance, and they have 4,742 publishers. So you can see there's a lot of interest right there on the island of Oahu and in Honolulu itself. We had uh, many more people attend the meeting than there are publishers at all of the island. Speaking with the brothers over there, we find that as they go from door to door, they might have a publisher that was there the day before, and the day before that, and maybe the day before that. They cover their territory in the Hawaiian Islands about once every week. And in many parts of the island, they cover the territory every day. Phone calls come into the branch office almost a weekly, uh, telling us that somebody had been there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Could you slow it down a little? They're not exactly that, but the people in Hawaii know that Jehovah's Witnesses are preaching the good news of God's kingdom, and they're growing very, very rapidly. The branch office there also takes care of all of the islands across the Pacific as far as Guam and Saipan, the Marshalls, Ponape, and Yat. And there were, uh, we have 43 special pioneers working as missionaries in these islands that have all come out of the Hawaiian Islands. Another very delightful thing about Hawaii, they have supplied Bethel with 50 brothers working in the Bethel home. They're very, very zealous there, and we're happy to have so many people in Bethel from Hawaii and so many working in the islands throughout the Pacific. They're doing an excellent work. So all of these brothers uh, around the world that we have traveled, as I said, send their warm, loving greetings to you. And it has been a real inspiration to us to see the forward movement of Jehovah's work and to see all of these people desirous of working together with God because they know that this is the day of salvation for them. Now they are alive. They don't know how much longer they're going to be alive, but while we're living, we can listen to the word of God. We can preach the word of God to others. We can help them to see the truth and come out of this old world and battle in the grave and take their stand on Jehovah's side. So elders, minister of servants, brothers and sisters, in all of these meetings tonight, take good care of this great crowd of people that Jehovah God through his son Christ Jesus is gathering together now. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, these also I must gather, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd, and this great crowd of other sheep are working together with him to accomplish this great work at the end of this system of things. So keep up your service. Don't be worried about 1975. We're glad it's here. We're delighted. And so the fans have pointed out, we're that much nearer to the end. But being that much nearer, let us work that much harder to gather together those people that love life so that they too can help us in getting this good news preached in all the world for a witness, and then the end will come. Tomorrow, Brother Franz and I and a few others will be traveling on homeward, but on our way we're stopping at Denver and they're arranging for a meeting there so that we can talk to them. And the next day we'll be back in Brooklyn, New York with a, a Sabetha family that is growing very, very fast. We have about 2,156 uh, in that family at Watchtower Farm and at Bethel. 
and they're doing a marvelous work. You probably heard it already, but our family is growing so big we bought the Towers Hotel. So we're uh, using that now as part of the Bethel family. So we're growing in Brooklyn. We're growing at the Watchtower Farm. In the first four months of this service here, the brothers at Bethel have produced more than 20 million pound books. If we print another 30 million, why, we'll catch up. But when we do that, there's going to be more orders there. But we're happy to be working day and night at Bethel to uh, serve you. But as we go on to Denver and on to home and the Bethel home, maybe all of you would like to send your loving greetings along. Thank you. Very, very much. The holy rich blessings go with all of you. Brother Noah and Brother Fran, the 20,124 here tonight and the 16,721 taking a total of 36,845 Brothers and sisters, want to extend our love to you, brothers, for the fine counsel that you've given us here this evening.